Okay, if we're on the weekly Torah portion, please subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, and also please hit the notifications at the bottom, I believe at the bottom, and uh, that way you'll always know when the new class is given. And we're about to start a new book. The new book is Vayikra. Vayikra means, and he called. It doesn't mean Leviticus. I don't know what Leviticus even means. Uh, oh, from Levitical rules. That's where Leviticus comes from, Levitical rules. Because when... From what? Levit, Levites. Oh, uh, yeah. So it's the rules, I'm guessing, Leviticus. Yeah. Probably some like laws of. I'm not really sure about that. But uh, when the non-Jews were deciding to label these books, they labeled it by the content of the book rather than what the book is called. So that's why Genesis yeah. is Genesis, because that's the beginning. Yeah. Exodus, because the Jews left Egypt. Uh, yeah. Leviticus, because of Levitical laws. What are you called by Midbar? No, numbers is because... I think of what everybody calls these things. Numbers is because the, all the tallies we keep doing in the book. So they said ta- uh, numbers. And then finally, Deuteronomy is repeat repetition. Means second, right? Yeah, du, duto, right? It's, it's a repetition. Yeah, like, like so deuce. that's right. So that's why the non-Jews called it what they called it. But you know, you know, I, it, it strikes me that some of the names are Greek and some are Roman. We have one English name, Numbers. Right? <laughs> oh, it's good. But uh, Genesis is Greek, I think. Yeah. Right. Exodus is. Say again. Numbers is Latin. Oh, ah, so okay, kind of, maybe, kind of maybe, Latin. okay. Latin, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Exodus is Latin? It has to be. Well, it's, you say Exodus is Exodus English is today. Latin. Well, but it gets, it's today Latin, it's English. Latin word. Roman, but the, 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 the point mm-hmm. is that that's where they got their names from. We get our names yeah. because of the the, uh, the first new word. Yeah, so, I'm yeah. Bereshit is Bereshit. Yeah. That's the whole name of the book. Yeah. Eli Shemot. Yeah. So, Eli, you're not going to name a book Eli, which is these. So, yeah. Shemot. So names. Why names? Because that's the important part, the families. Uh, okay, and it's also the second word. Then it comes to Vayikra, it's the first word. So, and there's also is, there's nuance in Vayikra, namely the small aleph. You see in the first word, oh, yeah. there's a yeah. small aleph. That small aleph is there for a reason. Mm-hmm. And the yeah, Hebrew is yeah, yeah. there for a reason, which we'll discuss in two yeah. seconds. Scripted when it comes to... Small, smaller like that. Oh. Right, so when it comes to numbers, it's going to uh, Bamidbar, because it says, uh, if you go to the beginning, you'll see Bamidbar as a new word, and then Devarim for Devarim for Deuteronomy. Again, Eliha Devarim, so these are the words. Fine. Say it again? No, I'm just showing the, uh, the, the, the small. Um, small olive, right? Small olive, yeah. And then the right. next olive, you're going, going down the line there, and that's showing what that's what it looks like. But it should be full size of that normally. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Now, in, in the book of uh, Vayikra, I'll, I'll stick with the Hebrew at this point. So I'll give everybody the, uh, the lowdown on how we get the English. I'm really not interested in what the non-Jews called it. Let's call it what the, the Jews call it, Vayikra. So uh, we get into the whole, uh, we get into a whole uh, bunch of laws dealing with, for the most part, for the most part, karbanot, for sacrifices. Now, interestingly enough, the laws in Vayikra are not repeated later on. In the book of Deuteronomy, the Devarim, not repeated. Hmm. Okay? And like other laws are. And why are they never repeated? Why is it that only the, the laws of the Korban are here for the, for the Kohanim and the Levium to do? Because Kohanim and Levium were known to be Zaruz b'mitzvot, careful to do the mitzvot, so you didn't have to repeat oh. all the things in Tavarim. Oh, it's only for the Kohanim and Levium, it's not for... For the most part. Again, you have laws of Kashut yeah. and so on oh. and so forth, which uh, those, those will be repeated, but uh, because that's for everybody. Those, that's for all of us, it right. needs to be repeated. But the laws that were specifically for the Kohanim and Levium are not going to be repeated in Tavarim, because, they, like I said, they were Zaruz but mitzvot. They were careful to do the mitzvot. Oh. So unlike the rest of the Jews, uh, who apparently were not so careful in their observance of the, that's the rest of you guys. Okay, we're not so careful in the rest of the stubborn, uh, stubborn and stiff-necked people. Whatever the case <laughs> is going to be, so that is why Hashem repeats them in Devarim, and all and certainly the uh, the the laws against idolatry. That is constantly re- repeated yeah. over and over and over and over. But we never see a repetition of the Levit- Levitical laws. Okay. So that's also something that's Leviticus, to keep in mind. Yeah, that's for the Leviticus. That's why it's right, called Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> just I don't make it up as I go along. <laughs> and now you also have something else which will, uh, which we will probably discuss. I forget where it is here, 
But uh, let's just run through it. What is a korban? Korban comes from the word karav. Uh, the, the shoresh is kuf resh bet, which means to come close. So that is the point of the korban. We're supposed to come closer to Hashem. It should not be considered a, this is something else, the, the non-Jewish world, especially the Christian world, took way out of context. But uh, they, you need the blood of the sacrifice. Without the blood of the sacrifice, therefore you cannot get atonement. And, and so what are we going to do since we have no more sacrifices? We are doomed to failure. We're doomed to death until we accept the final sacrifice, blah, 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 blah. Okay, <laughs> that's the Christian theology. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. that's because they missed the point. Ah, yeah. uh, the blood that of the sacrifice that had to be, the korban that had to be brought, it's true that that blood did have to be sprinkled in certain places, but they never really answer the mincha offering, which you also learn in this parsha, which is the flower offering. And the flower offering, you have no blood, and yet you still get to, uh, you still get forgiven. Well, how is that possible if I didn't have blood? It just shows again they picked out one thing, they didn't well, learn the rest of it. It was a convenient uh, theological uh, conundrum that they all because I guess they didn't study the rest of the book. I don't know. I can't answer for Christianity, I mean, nor do I try to. The concept of trying to reverse tying something in. You have to go, there's something rather here, they perceive something here. We've got to go backwards and justify that. Now. Right. No, I understand what they were trying to do, but I'm just saying that yeah, they yeah. didn't read yeah. the rest of the book. <laughs> they, they, if they just read the rest of the chapter, yeah, they would have seen this whole bunch of corporate sacrifices. So much in interpreting verses that they'll right. just pick something right. out and then just right. skip everything else. So now what happens one is, thing is, one thing, this is, this is it. Right, so what happens is when we're offering a korban, again, we're supposed to envision ourselves as if we were either the animal or whatever is being given to God, and to say that really by rights, if it's a sin offering, if it's a sin offering, then by rights, we should be giving ourselves, we should be dying for this. But Hashem has given us a way out, namely to give this korban, to be in our place, and therefore we should learn from that, but we should see ourselves when the blood is sprinkled and so on and so forth. We should uh, put ourselves in that place. Which is probably why, if, again, going back to Christianity for a second, which is probably why they said that Jesus would be the ultimate sacrifice. He would take our place. Yeah. But like I've always said, whenever it comes to that, the korban that I'm offering only gets me up to that point. It doesn't continue onward. In other words, once I bring one sin offering, for a particular sin that I did, it doesn't mean that's I can now right. sin the rest of my life uh-huh. because I brought that. Uh-huh. And that's, again, the problem with the uh, Christian religion, where they say that all I have to do is accept Jesus once, and then I can go, and if I kill somebody the next day, I'm still going to be saved because I was saved. Am I wrong or right? Correct. Okay. So I, I don't want to say, because I, I, I've learned enough about this to know that it's foolishness. That I, Again, all the Christians are now getting angry at me and saying, yeah, yeah. oh, well, how can you do this? But the concept is not, is not what the Torah was talking about. Again, the sacrifice was, until now, I'm good. In other words, it, it's up till now. And that's only if I was sincere. I had to be sincere with this. I can't just give the, the uh, can't make a barbecue out of this and say, well, God, I did what I did. You know, and now you have to forgive me. The answer is no. Teshuva is what I have to do first. I have to confess. I have to do teshuva. I have to do the uh, repentance. And then only after, at the final part of this, that's when I give my korban. And again, if I'm not rich enough, I give the mincha. So it's not, it doesn't even oh, have, have to be an animal. The animal. It's right. It's, even so, it would be the time to bring an animal. Right. For the, and that's the, why it says when it's talking about the mincha offering, it says vim nefesh, the soul. The poor person is giving his soul by giving the bread, mm-hmm. by giving the flour. Yeah, your question is? Say it again. Right. Also, humans aren't kosher, so. so. Oh. <laughs> okay. But the con- by the way, the concept. Yeah. I want to show you how the concept was taken out of context too. I love these things. Vayikra really opens the store to this. Well, one second. Yeah. The reason that they said the human, by the way, yeah. is because we have a concept. When a tzaddik dies, when a righteous person dies, that tzaddik is an atonement for his entire generation. Oh, yeah. When Moshe died, when uh, Aaron died, when. Uh, when, Mo, when Rev Moshe Feinstein died, when Rev Soloveitchik died, we always said that their death, if we took it to heart, would be an atonement for our generation. 
Okay? The concept is there. I don't argue with the concept. But again, oh. the concept is until that point. Not me, Kalahaba. Not from here and forever on. Rev Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, our greatest prophet, does not have the power by his death to cleanse us today from the sins we do. No matter how much I accept that he's taught Moshe Rabbeinu, it doesn't work. Okay, so that's the, that's the thing. The concept is there. I don't argue the concept. The concept's a fair concept. But it doesn't mean forever again. It doesn't mean uh, what they want it to mean. That's, that is ultimately idolatry. That's all. Yeah. Again, they're, they're hating me now. In, in, in 10 minutes, they're shutting me down. They're, they're not going to watch my videos anymore. Go ahead. Uh, so the, 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 the concept of, of the, the sin offering for uh, atonement, uh, for sacri- rather than itself, Hashem lets us sacrifice an animal. Is that how that relates back also to the binding of Isaac, where that is, where God says, "Don't do that. Take the animal in the bush." Oh, you want to say that is what we learn not to do animal sacrifice? Yeah, I mean the whole thing is not is not to sacrifice a human being per se. I mean, uh, is, is if we're doing it, uh, you could say that. I, I know people like to trace it to that. Yeah, yeah. The the what you're really seeing there is that. Uh, it was that was the ultimate test for Avraham, yeah. Because Avraham was minus harachim. He he was um, I'm sorry. He was the trade the trait of uh, uh, kindness, kindness, yeah. everlasting kindness. Yeah. So for him, and he was marchmanis. He was compassion. So he was not into. He would not have preached the uh, fire and brimstone speech. He would have given the uh, speech and saying, you have to love everybody. He, he would have been that kind of guy. Yeah. And he's preaching that to the world. Yeah. And he's against human sacrifice. Yeah. Okay, he's yeah. against all these things. You and don't do this. It must have existed all around him. Oh, it was, it was, all along. So then what happens is God says to him, going against his very ah. nature, yeah. bring, your, uh, bring, bring, your, bring your son and you're going to sacrifice him to me. And the question is, does he argue or won't he argue? If he argues, it means you don't accept me as God. Yeah. If you don't argue, yeah. Yeah. then you accept me as God. Yeah. And the uh, point is, he did. Yeah. He accepted him, and he was willing to go to the ends of the earth for God. And he said, okay, if you're going to tell me to sacrifice my son, I have to sacrifice my son. And even though it goes against my logic of how I see you, God, I have to do it, because I have no choice. That was the test of Avram. That's why it's the test of Abraham and not the test of Isaac. Isaac was willing to do it too. He's 37 years old when he's appearing upon the, uh, the altar. He also is being tested, but it wasn't his test because he was Mira Hadin. He was judgment. That was his trait. She said, okay, so whatever God wants, it's, this is normal for him. You want to kill me? You don't want to kill me. I, I, that's normal. Okay, it's either right or it's wrong, black and white. You want me? You want me. You don't, you know. That's not compassion. Compassion says, ah, let's have a discussion, which is why when Avram is hit up with Sodom and Amara, oh, yeah. which would have been a straight out, kill them. Yeah. They're wicked. What yeah. do you want from me? They, yeah. uh, what do you, I am, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm your righteous people. They're not. Kill them. Done. We'll, we'll wipe out a city. I'll take over the city. No problem. We'll have a good time. Okay. But he fights for them because that's his nature. So you would have thought he would fight for his son, but he can't. Because Hashem is not giving him, it's not saying your son is wicked, and therefore, like he did with Yishmael. Yeah. Right? And even there, oh, Moshe, yeah. even there, Avram was said, it's only when, only when Sarah said, kick him out. He was saying, ah, he was hanging and hawing. Suddenly God says, kick him out. Okay. Again, I can't fight God. <laughs> God says, do it. So he knows more than I do. I trust him implicitly. So here, once again, he comes to give your only son, even though he had two. And he goes at that, that whole argument that Rashi brings down, but in the end, he says, sacrifice him. Okay, you're the boss. There can be no argument. That's, what, that's really what that story is focusing on. What the, the uh, over the time, people have said, God was trying to show that human sacrifice is not good. I'm not buying that. Not from that particular story. It's just more of a personal thing between Abraham. Right. And it's not from that. I wouldn't. Yeah. I see how people would want to do we it. We don't have a specific time. Right. For right. The reason that, by the way, there, we have three animals that we can sacrifice. We can't sacrifice all the animals in the world. Yeah. Three. Uh, it's basically three: the the lamb, the the sheep, and uh, the cow. And then you have the uh, the pigeon and the um, 
uh, uh, turtle dove, uh, turtle, turtle dove and pigeon, right? Yeah. So those are your, and then the wheat. It's really all you get. You don't get to do a, a buffalo. You don't get to do a deer. Yeah. Uh, you don't uh, get to do yeah. the uh, a ram. Yeah. Oh, a ram is a, a deer. Okay. You don't get to do all these different ram. What's ram a ram? A ram is a sheep. Ram is okay, a ram. Good. Yeah. So ram is a sheep. You would do that. Okay, but the, so the, the Ramba, uh, Ramban, the Ramban says why those animals because those were the animals that the non-jews thought were gods oh and god is showing egyptians. they're not gods egyptians yeah. egyptians are there's I also hindus before also that. hindus yeah. but i mean the hindus weren't there but uh, there's yeah. that thought yeah. that those animals were gods or sure. representatives yeah. so that's what we're going to kill that's i'm sorry that's it's either Rambam or Ramban. I'm not sure which oh, one. Oh, even like in India. The, you can't right. Kill That's the Ramban. The Ramban says they're, they're talking about India. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's a clear answer to this. Yes. Where do the doves and, and pigeons fit in there? Like, the, is it all the same reason? Oh. Um, or they represent like Israel? And... They represent Israel. Okay. The dove represents Israel. Because okay. they, they have one, uh, one love. Right. So we're, it says we're connected to... Torah, one loves and one heart. So that would be the dove. I was trying to think, I know like the Egyptian rod. Right, right, right. But I'm just saying, right, but that's why these animals, it wasn't any animal. I couldn't bring any animal. I had to bring specific animals. No lions or tigers. No lions, tigers, or bears. (laughs) Oh my, right. None of those things. So, but that's what I'm saying. People, but that's, when we're looking at, when we look at Carbonus, it really, and I've spoken about every year, I have to keep emphasizing this. Uh, it's not something that we can just throw away as a cultic uh, service. There really is something going on here, and it, this is not the first time we get it. Adam Arishon brought a korban. A kind in Hevel brought a korban before. That, by the way, this argues against Rambam's oh. thing that is just trying to get rid of the idolatry, ah. because ah. who are they trying? They're the only people in the world. What do you mean? What's the idolatry you have? Yeah. That's Ramban. That's Nachmanides question on it. What are you talking about? You have a lot of people who gave sacrifices who weren't doing it to stop the uh, to stop the thought of the uh, of the idolaters. Before they were idolaters, they were giving sacrifices. So sac- again, Corbanus, the whole concept is to show I want to come closer to you. May it be if it's not for a sin offering, by the way, a totally burnt offering, or it could be a peace offering. There's different offerings we have. And even one that's even better. You have the sliding korban. What's the sliding korban? I'm going through this really quickly because we're not going to begin through the whole thing today. Okay, so the sliding one was I sinned when I was a rich guy. But what happened was, so I set aside the money, as it were, to the korban I have to bring, which would be the, uh, the expensive animal. Suddenly, the person becomes poor. The stock market crashes, wow. and he doesn't have any money anymore. He's, he's broke, and so you can't charge him for that particular sin. You can't charge him what you would have before. Wow. He doesn't have the money. Yeah. So now you give him the poorer. He gets to slide down, as it were, to the, uh, to the next stage of whatever the korban would be, and it, finally even to the lowest stage of the flower. Okay? That's the sli- There's certain ones that you can slide on. And, but that again, God wasn't saying, okay, look, you, uh, did, you did adultery. Oh, not adultery, because adultery is dead. <laughs> you did something like this, great. You know, that's, I'm going to charge you a lamb. That's what I want, because I'm hungry right now. <laughs> no, 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 it's for you. You have to do tshuva. So I'm giving you a methodology to do this. Okay, and so depending on what you can afford, uh, I don't want, I want, I'm not going to make you bankrupt, because I made you this way. I either made you rich or poor. By the way, it goes the other way too. If I was poor, if a person was poor and he sinned, suddenly he hits a mega box, he doesn't get away with the small Corbin either. Now he has to give one that's going to hurt him a little. So, okay. So again, it's a way to make me think about what I'm doing and do I really want to do this again? And if you think of how much it costs to kill a cow, certainly in those days of killing cows, where you're giving the whole thing to God, that's a major amount of money you're giving over. Okay. Even today, to kill a cow, just to burn it up. <laughs> it hurts a little bit. <laughs> yeah, just a little. Just a little. Or maybe a lot. Right. <laughs> but again, that's all because we're trying to get close to Hashem. Okay, this is all helping us, but we have to do, admit our fault. We have to do tshuva. We have to do all the steps. Korban is the last one. That's, that's the last part of it, okay? So that's why I'm saying people misunderstand it. 
and it's no good when you misunderstand things. Okay, so now let's get to the actual partial and see how far we can get. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it says, Vayikra again, I pointed out that it has a small aleph. Yeah. So it says, well, uh, we'll read the, uh, right here, he'll explain it. He said, he called, I can, we can go through the Rashi, but we'll, we'll do that in two seconds. So he says, Vayikra al Moshe. So he called to Moshe, the latter chapters of Exodus relate that the tabernacle had been built and became a fitting resting place for the Shekhinah, God's the presence and for the sacrificial service. So great and awesome was the glory that Hashem of Hashem, the, uh, so awesome and great was the glory of Hashem that had covered the tabernacles that even Moshe was afraid to enter. Consequently, Hashem called, quote unquote, called to Moshe to reassure him that the tabernacle had been built to benefit him and his people, not to exclude them. The sages expound that this summons to Moshe is mentioned to teach that whenever Hashem wished to impart a new command to him, he first summoned him lovingly and saying, Moshe, Moshe, he repeated the word because when you want to call somebody in a loving manner, you repeat their name. Okay? David, David, come, come. You're showing your, your uh, that's, that's computer lovingly. In reply, Moshe would say, Hineni, I am at your service. Not here I am, behold, there I am, but what Hineni means, I'm at your service. That's how Rashi explains it. As the verse implies, the call, uh, the call came exclusively to Moshe. Hashem's voice is powerful enough to shatter trees and be heard throughout the world, but it was the divine will that be heard only by Moshe, so nobody else would hear when Hashem was calling to Moshe. The sages teach that Hashem spoke to Moshe with a loud thunderous voice, but, merely, but only he was able to hear it. If the people were not meant to hear Hashem's voice, why was it necessary for him to speak so loudly? <laughs> the sages wish to teach us that even though we know the commandments only from Moshe, we should bear in mind that Hashem's voice was loud enough for everyone to hear. It was the people who were not worthy of hearing it. This is why I always said to people, God is speaking to us every day. We're just not on the God channel. You have to be tuned in. Okay? And, the, and the way that Ashkel is putting it uh, from others, the sages, they're saying that we aren't worthy of hearing it. We don't have the right antennae. Accordingly, we should consider ourselves as if every Jew personally had been commanded by Hashem. For the same reason, all future Jewish souls were at Sinai when the Ten Commandments were given. Souls without bodies are not obliged to keep commandments, but Hashem wanted all future generations to know that the Torah was meant for them as much as those who left Mitzrayim. Okay, that's Rav Moshe. So now the small Aleph. He says the word Vayikra, from the word from the root Karak, which means to call, it also indicates that Hashem wished to speak to Moshe and purposely called to him. Hashem's prophecy to Bilam, on the other hand, uh, is introduced by Vayikar, the same root, the same root, right? Without an Aleph, a word which has two connotations. One is Mikra. Uh, and, and, and spiritual contamination, as in Samuel, uh, what we're learning. This implies that while Hashem had reason to speak to Bilam, he did not so do, he did not do so lovingly. In this verse, the summons to Moshe is spelled with a miniature aleph, as if to make it appear that the word used for Bilam, that it could look like the word used for Bilam. The commentators find homiletic insights in this. And we go, and it says, in his monumental humility, this is a famous one from the Balatora, Moshe wished to describe Hashem's re revelation to him with the same uncomplimentary word used for Bil'am, without an Aleph, Vikar. But Hashem instructed him to include the Aleph as an expression of affection. Too humble to be do so heartily, Moshe wrote a small Aleph. So he followed directions, but he was wanted to be humble about it. Okay, fine. The smallness is meant to give prominence to the letter, as if it were a separate word. So the word Aleph means to teach, thus implying that one should learn always to be small and humble. No man was better qualified to teach this lesson than Moshe, who was not only the greatest of all prophets, but the humblest person who ever lived. Okay, so that's your small Aleph. So really, it should, uh, Hashem was saying, Vayikra, we use big Aleph. Okay, Moshe is told, and Moshe has a little bit of a discussion. I, I'm not, I'm not Roy, for, I'm not fit for this. Blah blah blah. Hashem says, okay, so you can write a small aleph, and that, would, that way both of us are happy. So the world knows that you were humble about it. At the same time, you're at a, you're at a much higher level than Bilam. Well, now, who was Bilam? 
Bilam was the prophet of the non-Jews who uh, would be the, the uh, one to try to curse the Jews, right? And so why was he given prophecy? Ever, you ever wonder that? Why did God, and we have a whole section, Balak, right? When we hear about Bilam. So, yeah? Correct. If the rest of the, if, the, if God never gave the non-Jews a prophet, they could have said, if you would have given up sky like Moshe, we also would have done this. Yeah. We also would have accepted the Torah. And Hashem said, I, I did. And his name is Bilam. <laughs> he even has a chapter in the whole Torah there for him. Ah. So, yeah. you, and you didn't listen. He tried to curse my people. And even though he understood it was me, he was trying to do all the tricks. And even when he lost, what does he do? He tells you how to corrupt my people. So you, you're wrong. You wouldn't have changed. Okay. That's the ultimate thing about Bil'am. That's what we have to hear about. Okay, so it ends again. Uh, so by the way, also this is um, Rashi says, the whole Dibrot, and uh, before all, for all the uh, statements, the whole Amir and all the sayings, the uh, whole Savoyim, and, and for all the commandments, Kadma Kriya, he would start with Vayikra. Why? Why? Because that was a lesson of Chiba, and that's a lesson of endearment. I'm just going through the Rashi. And how do we know that's a de- in terms of endearment? Because lashon shal malachi ashar v'mishtam It's the language, and this you should know from davening every single morning. It's the language that the the administering angels use towards each other when it says the karaze el zevi amar, and each called to himself and said, "What do they say? Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh." Right. So that's what's going on. Holy, holy, holy. So if the Malachi Hasharet use that language and it's in terms of endearment, so now Hashem is using it as a term of endearment. That's how we, they learn it out. Okay. And the rest we did. Now, okay. Then it says, Vayadibir Hashem Elav. And that's all from three words, by the way. <laughs> okay. Vayadibir Hashem Elav. For all the, I'd say you can't learn anything from three words. And Moshe spoke to him. So it's Vayikra Vayadabir. Normally Vayadabir is a language of harsh. When you would say Vayadabir, it's, it's, a, it's a PL. So Vayadabir, I'm speaking to them. I'm, it's like when Judge Judy would say, I'm speaking, I'm speaking. Okay, it's just, that's basically be quiet. Okay, it's about because you have Vayikra El Moshe, and then Vayadabir, and then for Lemur, there's all terms of endearment. Okay, so that's what's going on. So Vayadabir Hashem 11 also, by the way, the Ramban points out something very important. In this entire book, Whenever we're talking, I should say, whenever we're talking about Karbanis, we only see the name Hashem, Yudke Vavke. We never see Elohim. We never see anything else. Because Yudke Vavke symbolizes Midat HaRachamim, compassion. When it comes to judgment, there is no, again, there's no leniency in judgment. It's either right or wrong, black and white. When it comes to everything else, when I want you to forgive you, that's the Midah, that's the trait of ju- of of compassion. And that's why it says, Vayedeber Hashem Elav. Hashem, that, that uh, trait is speaking to him. Me'ohel Mo'ed, from the tent of meeting, lay more to say, or quote, okay, and why from, uh, uh, from the Ohel Mo'ed, he says that, it teaches, Rashi says, Malamed, uh, that uh, teaching you Shaya Kol Nifsak, that the voice stopped, and the voice did not, the voice of God did not go out of uh, outside the ohel, outside the tent. And then he asked, could it be that he had a low voice? No, he had a big voice, and so on and so forth. But we're not going to get into all that. Okay, and uh, so then it says here in, in his uh, commentary, from, the, tab- from the, uh, the tabernacle, this was the moment when Hashem wanted to impress upon Israel that they, not Moshe, had the responsibility to be worthy of receiving prophecy. It was the first revelation in the new tabernacle, <coughs> excuse me, which had been built with their contributions as the place where Hashem's presence would rest among them. Now it was important for them to be made aware of their responsibility to maintain a high level of holiness. Thus the verse emphasizes that this prophecy was given in the tent of meeting. It wasn't given somewhere else. It wasn't given in the wilderness. I'm giving, you built the house for me. I'm going to use the house you built. Okay. Then saying, so the term Lemur usually means that Moshe was instructed to convey Hashem's teaching to the nation. In our verse, however, this interpretation is not tenable because the very next verse specifically instructs Moshe to teach these commands 
if so, why? What was he to say to the people? Moshe wanted Hashem wanted Moshe to convey the inspiring but sobering message that his awesome degree of, pro of prophecy was granted only for the benefit of the people and only as long as they may remain worthy of it. So again, Moshe's exalted level of prophecy was only because of the people. If the people would fall, their pro the, his prophecy would end. So really, everybody was tied together. That's why you say, so everybody's tied together. Oh, nice. Now it says, So you speak to B'nai Yisrael, and you should say to them, Adam, a person, when he wants to bring a korban for Hashem, he can bring it from a behemoth, from the domesticated animal, from the cattle, from the cattle, from the sheep, you will bring, you plural, will bring your, your sacrifice. So now you have to look at the language very carefully. Why does it say Adam? Why does it say man? Amen, yeah. Why does it say, well, it says Adam, amen. So why? It says, Kishi Yakriv, when he brings, that's number one. But Karbanot Nedava Dibera Indian. So we're talking about voluntary offerings. That's number one. When we want to bring a voluntary offering, we can bring it from Bakar, I mean, at home, from the cattle and the sheep. Okay, that's the, the domesticated animals we're talking about. And then it says, Adam. Lama Nemar, what, why does it use the word Adam? Why does it say Ish? Why does it say Isha? And by the way, if it said Ish, oh. it could have also included a woman. Because uh, you would say a man, since, he, since Hebrew, uh, if, if you make a group, again, if I have a million women oh. and oh. one man, oh. Hebrew would default to the male. Always. So it's not a matter of the language, or you want to call it patriarchal, call it what you want, but it, the way that God made it was uh, that the, if you, once you have mixed sexes, it always goes to the masculine, always. So if that's the case, use ish. Why do you have to say Adam? So that's what Rashi's bringing up, Lama Nehmer. So he says, Ma Adam, Harishon lo hikriv min gazel, just as the first man where it did not bring it from, uh, guess from something that was stolen. Shekol because.